What's up, people? I'm Shaggy, the Opinionated Hippie, and today I'm going to review and rank in the order of my personal favorite, Flo and Eddie's five studio and one partially studio, partially live album. Um, what's the connection to Frank Zappa? Well, Flo and Eddie were in the band for a couple years. They're on a whole bunch of albums, on a couple box sets, made a guest vocal appearance in 76. We're going to do more, but then one of their band members died, so they canceled on a couple others. Uh, I think they made one appearance in 77, and I'm pretty sure it was 88, or at least in 87, they were in the tour rehearsals for the 88 band, but for some reason, I think that fell through. But if I'm not mistaken, they were rehearsing with them in 87, right? For a couple, at least there's some rehearsal information or tapes floating around out there. Um, but anyways, they did five albums. Um, yeah. Um, I, I don't think any of them is a must listen in any way, shape or form, but I think there's a couple that are surprisingly have some moments that are actually surprisingly good. Um, and, uh, they kind of fall their best music, um, always has some little bit of sort of like flow and eddy type quirk about it. But when they try to play it kind of straightforward as they do on a couple of these albums, um, Howie's got a great voice. Mark, who sings much less than a Howie, has, a, I think, an engaging voice. Their material was pretty fantastic. And their best albums, the songs kind of are either sort of this Alice Cooper-esque, maybe slightly less evil, but that kind of sort of like rock, slightly heavy edge. They, were as def they did open for Alice Cooper, I think, on the Billion Dollar Baby Store. So there is like a, there is an Alice Cooper connection and a couple other albums. You can feel a little bit of that Alice Cooper energy in the songs versus just these like great, awesome sort of Turtles inspired 60s pop songs of which are there are a handful of just fantastic sort of just 60s like Turtles-esque mm. songs on their stuff. Um when they go for the comedic stuff, I'm not a big fan. When they do things and try to maybe experiment with other genres, as you will see shortly on this list, I'm not a big fan um, of them doing it. But I do think there's a couple good albums, pretty much the top two, maybe the top two and a half on this list, I think are worth checking out because you, you might enjoy them. But anyways, that's all I got. Let's get on uh, to album number five. Number five is their uh, fifth studio album. Didn't come out till 1981 after a several year break. Um, this is called Rock Steady with Flo and Eddie, and this is a reggae slash rock steady album. Yeah, it was recorded in Jamaica. Um, yeah, I think the uh, was unproduced by the guy who fronted Hot Chocolate. And pretty interesting. Had a couple good songs, um, but yeah, I just. I'm not a big fan of anybody doing reggae music that's not just like 100% reggae artist. Don't tip your toes in reggae. Dip your toes, don't tip your toes in reggae either. That's just weird. Um, I just, doesn't do it for me. I'm not a big fan of Frank doing it, not a big fan. Uh, Eric Clapton dips into some reggae a lot that I'm not always a big fan of. Um, Fish, I mean, almost every band dips their toes in reggae, it seems, and I don't know why, but it just seems like there's, something's just lacking. And this album, I just can't, I mean, I've tried, but it just doesn't do it for me. Um, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. I don't think they're like, there's no mocking of anything. They're not really trying to like do anything ridiculous or too silly. I mean, there's a couple good melodies in it. Um, Albert Wing is on this album. Um, I'm just now, Walt Fowler is on this album. Um, this might be the connection maybe with how they ended up on that 88 rehearsals, those 87 rehearsals maybe. But uh, anyways, yeah. I mean, if you like reggae, I mean, Howie's got a great voice, um, you know, so I, I think there's even a reggae version of Happy Together, which I'm not sure anybody needs to hear ever. But anyways, it's, I mean, I don't know. You might love it. I don't. It's my least favorite. I never listen to it. I don't want to hear Flo and Eddie do reggae. That's my bad. It's on me. But I'll take the slings and arrows from that. But it's easily my number five. Number four is their third album. It is a live album with a couple studio tracks, maybe three, I think, um, maybe a little more. Um, uh, not The audience is not always present in the high in the mix, but when it's live, it's clearly live. Um, this came out in 1975. Um, yeah, you see the name, Illegal, Immoral, and Fattening. And they dip, they go straight into the comedy stuff. And this is probably the album that if you love uh, Fillmore East from Zappa. If you love 
uh, just another band from LA because of the Flo and Eddie stuff. This is probably the Flo and Eddie album for you. I mean, there's even what is essentially a seven and a half minute Eddie, are you kidding, on here. Um, they do cover some Frank. Um, so there's all that. But really, and also even though there are only, I think, three actual live tracks, three actual studio tracks, if I'm not mistaken, um, one of them is going to make my top 10 list of top 10 songs, so I had to include this album. Um, but it opens up with two studio tracks, um, Illegal, Immoral, and Fattening, and Rebecca. They might be live. They sound studio. They sound really good. Illegal, Immoral, and Fattening is maybe them leaning a little too much and like, hey, this might be a funny album. Um, but then Rebecca, awesome turtle-esque pop song, just like a thing of absolute beauty, a great little song. Um, though I do think we're flirting with old men singing about teenage girls a little bit, which I'm never a fan of. Then we get Kama Sutra time, which is this live, which probably would have been fun to see in person. Like they reference a whole bunch of other bands, like how he's just on a riff. And so if you reference like T-Rex, they go into a T-Rex song because they used to, they did backing vocals with T-Rex. That actually is pretty good. But then they do an Elton John sort of tease with Benny and the Jets. They throw in some Joni Mitchell and some Crosby, Stills and Nash. Um, one great line from here. Um, it's a fine line between Joni Mitchell and Yoko Ono. That's a great line. I think Howie just kind of randomly spits that out at one point. Love that line. Um, that goes into the Sanzini Brothers return. We get the Sanzini Brothers doing the Tibetan memory trick, which you can hear on a Billy the Mountain. I think it's on the Carnegie Hall. And the Tibetan memory trick is this like, Google it, but it's this like thing that you're supposed to memorize. I think it was like a sales pitch thing to try to memorize this and like be able to do it. Um, it's, it's kind of like a 12 days of Christmas, but with other things where you go one turtle, two, one turtle and two turtle doves, one turtle, two, 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 and you just keep going. The impressive thing about it with them is Mark and Howie are doing it simultaneously and just nailing it. I do think the version on Carnegie Hall, which comes in the middle of Billy the Mountain, is better than the version on this just because it's such a random thing to have in the middle of Billy the Mountain. Uh, but that's pretty cool. Uh, Living in the Jungle. Yeah, they're pushing the line here with like, um, yeah, with everything about this song, I have to admit. Um, yeah, it's just them acknowledging sort of music tropes and what color people play those music tropes. And it's an interesting little number. Musically, it's great. I mean, the band is fantastic. Um, we get Cheap, which is a short little song. We get the Kung Fu Killer, which is him uh, riffing on why do so many people like um, uh, Kung Fu Fighting and how it's a horrible song. Um, it sounds like this, that Kung Fu Killer might be a part of another song because it seems like we're coming in mid, mid like, it's like an improv section in the middle of a longer song. That goes into Eddie, Are You Kidding? Eddie, Are You Kidding? goes into this thing called the Pop pop Star Massage Unit, which is uh, how we going off on sort of, you know, paraphernalia, as Frank would call it. Stuff you would find in the in the back pages of the free press, um, that kind of stuff. Um, and then they go back into Eddie, Are You Kidding? at the end of that. So it's essentially like a seven and a half minute Eddie, Are You Kidding? with this like, this rant in the middle by Howie. Uh, my favorite thing uh, from the original version, which is not on here, is Little Emil does not get a shout out. I think that's my favorite part of the Eddie Are You Kidding? is the shout out to Little Emil. He's not on this. Um, Let Me Make Love to You, which is another uh, studio track, which is actually pretty good. And then it closes out with a there's no business like show business, end of the road, wrap things up, kind of silly little live number. Um it's a fun listen maybe once. I think live it was probably better than this. This is not the Flo and Eddie I want. I like the Flo and Eddie that's more balanced with music. This is not that. Um, so for that reason, it's my number four. Illegal, immoral, and fattening. Uh, my number three is essentially, I think, their fourth album, their third studio, if you count that last one as a live one. Uh, Moving Targets came out in 1976. Um, and this is a pretty good album. It's pretty straightforward. Again, you get a little bit of flow and Eddie quirkiness and some of the melodies and just some of the constructions of their songs. The band sounds fantastic. And there's a couple just outright excellent, excellent songs on here. Um, the first side is kind of this pretty interesting balance between sort of Alice Cooper type rockers, just definitely not as evil, but just that sort of like streamed line rock efficiency that I think early Alice Cooper albums have in like the early 70s, just a little bit of edge. 
but just some really good melodicism in them. This is a little more melodic because it's Flo and Eddie, but you get Mama Open Up, which is a pretty good sort of Alice Cooper type rocker. The Love You Gave Away, which we're now going into some beautiful turtle-esque sort of energy. Uh, then we got Hot, we're going back to that harder energy. We're going to Best Friends, more into that poppy energy. Uh, the Love You Gave Away, I think is the one, or maybe it's Best Friends. One of these has a full-on Chicago vibe, like horns, just sounds like it could have been a Peter Cetera Chicago song. Um, Best Friends, in parentheses, is called Theme from the Unsold TV Pilot. Um, it does sound like it could be like a Saturday Night Live or something, like a, a theme show for some cheesy little like TV show from the 70s. Um, it's a fun, upbeat, kind of lighthearted, nice song. Um, Best Possible Me is a little bit more of a darker energy to close out Side A. Side 2 opens up with one of their best songs, Keep It Warm. Great lyrics. Starts off without how like just, hey, we got to write another song because we need the money. We got to keep it warm. And then it's like all these these variety of like images of people who could keep it warm, including some pretty dark stuff. Like there's a line in here. Um, we get some Beach Boys references. Um, we get some Beatles references. Neither one, I think, the most glowing, especially the Beatles one. Uh, we get what could be a yes reference, kill another whale, but the wet, but yes didn't come out with don't kill the whale for a couple years. So it's maybe yes heard this was like, we got to respond. Um, but then one of the lines is kill another whale, shoot another kid from the tower, which here in Texas, not something you joke about. Um, but it's got some dark lyrics, but it's a really, really, just a really, I don't know, it's definitely not a joke song. It's got some heavy issues that it's kind of tackling and addressing. And Howie's voice is just amazing. Um, it's got a song called Guns, which is kind of an upbeat poppy song, but like really good sort of almost new wave poppy energy. Um, and then the rest of the album, what do we got? Uh, oh, a cover of Eleanor. Um, I'm okay with that. I love Eleanor. That's a great song. Dropping on the middle of side two kind of lifts up the album. The other two songs, Sway When You Walk and Moving Targets, you know, aren't aren't the greatest. Maybe don't quite, quite grab you as much as the other stuff, but I don't think it's a bad album. Um, and, and Keep It Warm, I think, is a song that's definitely worth checking out if you just want to check out her song or two, because that is really a, a fantastic song um, with some kind of dark lyrics at times. But yeah, comfortably, uh, my number three, uh, Moving Targets. Uh, number two is their second album titled Flo and Eddie. This one's a little more ambitious then maybe moving parts and maybe moving parts from start to finish might be a slightly more successful album. But there were moments on here that I think are just fantastic. And I'm going to give them props for the failures because the f there's one song on it, which I just don't like. Um, but they managed to kind of make some things interesting, uh, which surprises me. Um, but so we have, um, what do we have on here? Uh, yeah, so this is their second album. came out in 1973. Um, again, the band is absolutely fantastic. I say again, I haven't mentioned it before. Ainsley Dunbar on drums, Jim Pond's on bass. So you got that hardcore Zappa rhythm connect rhythm section that's like bringing it. Um, opens up, if we only had the time, kind of a really good original song that they wrote, uh, good energy. And then that goes into a cover of Days. And I definitely prefer the Kinks version of this, but Howie's voice... Like, he kind of sounds like Ray Davies. Like, he does a good job of pulling it off. Like, it's just like, I'm not sure we needed a cover of Days. Like, I know Elvis Costello did a cover of Days for some, like, I think a King's Tribute album at some point. And again, I like Elvis Costello's voice, but I don't know. We don't need a version of this, but I kind of like it and how he sounds great. A song called You're a Lady, which really works. Um, and then we get... We get something that's just a mistake. It's sort of their version of Ween's Buenas Tardes Amigos. Uh, and it just, it's called Carlos in the Bowl. It just, I don't know, it's playing with all those sort of like, you know, Toreador, you know, sort of Mexico, sort of that kind of vibe that Buenos Tardos Amigos is, is toying with. I just don't think it pulls it off as well. And it, it's kind of painful at times and kind of cringy. Um, it, yeah, so it's, it, it brings it down. Uh, but then we get a cover of the Small Faces Afterglow, which I think is a nice choice of covers. Uh, we get another cover of the song Best Part of Breaking Up is Making Up With You. Pretty good song. That's just them sort of indulging in their turtles-ness. 
And then the thing that I actually think saves this song in a weird, in this album in a weird way, is this song called, is the Sanzini Brothers. The Sanzini Brothers is on the album. Um, but at the end of the Sanzini Brothers, there's just absolutely amazing sort of like instrumental postlude, this like coda, but Ian Underwood gets a writing credit on this. So I don't know if Ian Underwood wrote it. I don't know if Ian Underwood wrote the, did, did, did the Circus Sanzini Brothers and whether Mark and Howie wrote this. But the last half of this song, which maybe should have been indexed separately and not included on Sanzini Brothers, is this really sort of dark, psyche little instrumental thing that is fantastic and kind of makes sitting through the Sanzini brothers completely worth it. The whole thing's pretty short. It's not that long, but that last part is so good. Another Pop Star's Life is a pretty good sort of straightforward kind of rocky song, Just Another Town. And then they close with something called Marmondy Mill, which is like a seven minute sort of their kind of maybe the Who type like early who where it's sort of like a mini rock opera and we have like people talking and we literally are calling Howie and Mark by name and it's like all these sort of different parts that tell this story and it just kind of works. It's just kind of this super indulgent, very early 70s, a little bit of a who flavor, maybe a little bit of Zappa, just it feels like a really good flow and Eddie moment. Um, so I feel weird putting this at two. It's probably pretty close moving targets in this or maybe like this and this, but there are some really, really good moments on this album that I really like. And uh, I think they're just maybe trying things a little bit more, maybe being a little more just out there. Plus it was produced by Bob Ezrin who did produce Alice Cooper's early stuff. So yeah, anyways, but yeah, that's my number two, barely. This and three are just like that. But number one, clearly number one is my number one is they their debut album the fluorescent leech and eddie this came out in 1972 uh the band is uh dunbar on drums pawns on bass don preston on keyboard so we got three former zappa people former mothers bringing it musically um really good album um i think this is by far their most consistent some actually great songwriting on here um, maybe two songs, one that I just don't like, another one that I think ruins the vibe of the album, and that's the opening song. The opening song is Flo and Eddie theme. And I think it almost sets up the album as some kind of weird joke or some kind of weird, like, something that it's not, because then the rest of the album are just really, really well-constructed, good, tight, either pop rock songs or sort of 60s pop, that kind of pop psych turtles vibe. Um, so you get rid of the flow and Eddie theme to open, which I just think you don't need. The next two songs, Thoughts Have Turned and It Never Happened, open up with these really catchy, sort of brief, to the point, concise guitar licks that immediately you get these guitar licks setting up the, the, you know, the energy and then Dunbar and Pons jump in with the rhythm section and you got a great song. You got great singers, you got great energy, you got a great band, really good songs. Uh, the fourth song, Burn the House, kind of slows it down. What do we, I think the whole, the line is something like, what are we going to do tonight? We can burn the house, but it's literally like looking for things to do and burning the house is one of the options. Um, Lady Boo, Blue, Strange Girl, another really good sort of opening riff that maybe could have been a little bit heavier and that they could have leaned into it a little more, but it's just nice and to the point and kind of sets up a really strong vibe. Um, Who But I has some really good sort of Blue Bayou energy to open it up, like boom, boom, boom. Boom. You almost want to hear little Ro Linda Ronstadt coming in singing some Blue Bayou, but it's just got this great, awesome open bass line. Boom, boom, boom. I think I'm singing Blue Bayou and not this song with some just nice sort of arpeggiated guitar that kind of sets a really kind of slow mood before the song sort of uh, kind of unfolds. Really strong side A. Um, on side B, you got I've Been Born Again, which kind of has, has a loosier, jazzier feel. Uh, Preston kind of is a little bit prominent in this one. We get some good Don Preston energy um, coming in there. Um, goodbye, surprise, some really nice tight poppy energy. Um, really love, another really fantastic song on the second side. Um, we're getting some more like Alice Cooper energy seeping in on these songs. Um, Feel Older Now, which is just an absolutely fantastic song. Another just absolutely great, just like 
Just the band doing really, really good music. Field Order Now is a fantastic song. And then it closes with There You Sit Lonely, which is another strong song. The only song I don't like, and I, the Flo and Eddie theme, it's not that I don't like it. I think it just detracts from like the seriousness of the album, is this song called Nikki Hoy, which was co-written with Jeff Simmons. It feels sort of like a version of what the Kinks was doing with Holiday and Waikiki, but they're not Ray Davies. It doesn't come off as well. That whole sort of Islander type thing, it just, it doesn't work on this album. And it kind of reminds me of that Carlos and the Bull on the previous album. It's just, they're going for a vibe that they don't need to do. Stick with their lane. They're really good at what they do, writing these like short, effective pop songs. Um, so the Nicky Hoy just kind of cringeworthy. But the rest of the album, really, really good. And I actually think this is worth listening. If you like 70s pop, if you're a fan of that sort of early, tight Alice Cooper energy, and you want some of that, but with what I think is a better singer and Howie, if you if you miss, if you want more Turtle songs, you've already like played out the entire, entire Turtle repertoire, listen to this album. Listen to these first, listen to the top three albums on this list, um, because I think there's some pretty good stuff on here. But anyways, that's my number one, their debut album, The Fluorescent Leech. Yeah, so that's what they look like in writing. Um, a really, the top, I mean, the top one is fantastic. The top two and three both have issues. Three might be a little more consistent. Like, I don't think there's any real bad lows, but there's a couple really good highs on two. Again, I might put two and three as the same as I'm talking through it in real time. I'm realizing that the things on two I don't like might bring it to three. But I don't know. Anyways, you know how this works. Does it really matter? I don't think it does. Uh, you decide for yourself. Make your own decisions, people. However, stay away from Rocksteady unless you really, really, really like your reggae. Um, but anyways, that's all I got. Thanks for watching. I would love to know if anybody out there also listens to Flo and Eddie and has an opinion on any of these albums. And I'm really excited to see if anybody goes out there and checks them out and then gets back to me. Because um, I think, uh, yeah, because I really do think they they could have been a bigger, better thing if maybe they had marketed themselves different or they had the right DJ, play certain songs at that first album. Like, I think there's some good quality music on those first, on those three, quote unquote, uh, serious albums. But anyways, thanks for watching. Subscribe, like, share, comment, do all those things you're supposed to do. And enjoy life, people. Enjoy life. Peace. Talk to you later.